Good afternoon, members, officers, and many members of the public who are viewing the live stream of this meeting. May I welcome you all to this meeting of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee of South Cambridgeshire District Council. My name is Gre Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, and I'm the chair of the committee. Could I ask those members present in the council chamber to note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, may be broadcast at some point. The camera follows the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are re requested to wait just a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. And may I ask those participating in the meeting via the live stream, please indicate that you wish to speak through the chat column, and please do not use it for any other purpose. Please make sure that your device is fully charged and that you have switched your microphone off unless you are invited to do otherwise. And please ensure that you have switched off or silenced any other devices you may have so they do not interrupt proceedings. And please use a headset if available when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. When you are invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately, speak slowly and clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Now, please note that if we do need to vote on any item, we should do so via the microphones. Sadly, only those present in the chamber can vote or propose or second recommendations. Now, committee members present in the chamber, I will now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. Members, after I call your name, please turn on your camera and microphone, wait two seconds and say your name so that your presence may be noted. And as I said earlier, my name is Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, Chair of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. And now I would invite my Vice Chair, Councillor Judy Friffis, please to introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Councillor Judy Griffith and I'm Vice Chair of this committee and I represent Milton and Waterfeet Ward. Thank you, Judith. And now, may I invite Councillor Anna Bragnan, please, to introduce yourself. Thank you, Chairman. I'm Councillor Anna Bragnan and I represent Milton and Waterfeet Ward as well. Thank you very much. And now, Councillor Claire Daunton, please. Yes, I'm Councillor Claire Daunton and I'm one of the members for the Fenditon and Fullbourne Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Sally Ann Hart, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm Sally Ann Hart and I'm one of the members for the Melbourne Ward. Thank you. Councillor Martin Kahn. Hello, I'm Councillor Martin Kahn and I represent Histon in Hinton and Waterford Park. Thank you. Councillor Peter Faines. Councillor Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Thank you. Councillor Aidan van der Weyer. Yep, I'm Aidan van der Weyer. I'm from uh, Barrington Ward. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. Councillor Richard Williams, I represent the Whittlesford Ward. And when Councillor Sarah Chung takes her seat, she can introduce herself immediately too. Press the button, Sarah. Welcome. Right. Well, we have with us Councillor Sarah John Johnson. I can vouch for that. And I, can I also ask Graham, Councillor Graham Cohn, to introduce himself, please? I can, I can vote for Graham Cohn's attendance because I can see him, so I know he's here. 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Graham. I'm the member for Penzi and Portwall. Thank you very much. And joining us remotely, we have Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Um, yes, Councillor Nigel Cathcart, a member for the Bassingbourne Ward. Thank you very much. And Councillor Steve Hunt. Hello, Councillor Steve Hunt, Eastern Infington and Ultra Park. Thank you very much. We are also joined in the chamber by our Chief Operating Officer, Anne Ainsworth. And we're joined remotely by the Leader of the Council, who I believe may be enjoying a holiday somewhere in Great Britain. Leader, would you like to just introduce yourself, please? Hi, hello. hello, I'm Bridget Smith. I'm the Leader of the Count of South Cambridge and District Council. I'm a member for Gambling Gay Ward, and yes, I've just come off the beach, so... Uh, <laughs> But uh, you're worth it, so that it's fine. Thank you very much. And we're also joined, joined by our Chief Executive remotely, Liz Watts. Liz, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Good evening, members, and thank you, Chair. Liz Watts, Chief Executive Council. Thank you. And we have two members of Democratic Services supporting us this evening, Erin Clark and Ian Senior. Welcome to you both. Thank you. So I'm pleased to say that I can confirm Oh, Sarah, I'm sorry. Would you like to very briefly introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Sarah Chung Johnson. I'm councillor for Long Sampton. Thank you very much. I can confirm that our meeting this evening is quorum. But could I ask that if at any time any member leaves the building, would they please make that fact known so that it can be recorded in the minutes? Item two on our agenda is apologies for absence. Can I ask Ian Senior, are there any apologies for absence this evening, Ian, please? No, no apologies, Chair, but I should, should add that uh, Councillor Graham, uh, sorry, Councillor Jeff Harvey is also in the meeting, I think, uh, yes. um, remotely. My apologies. Councillor Jeff Harvey, would you like to just yes. confirm your attendance, please? There may be. Councillor Jeff Harvey, would you just introduce yourself, please? I think you're mute, Jeff. Chair. Oh, he's not sorry, there. No, I'm, I'm not sure gone. he's here. Thank you. No, fine. Let's uh, move on. Uh, item three on the agenda is declarations of interest. May I ask, do any members have interest to declare? in relation to any item of business on this agenda. No. Um, just a reminder that if an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point. Item four on the agenda is the minutes of the meeting held on the 22nd of June 2021. Um, can I just go through it page by page for accuracy, please? Page one. Councillor Rickard. Um, on page one of the minutes, it says that Councillor Steve Hunt was in attendance by invitation, whereas he's actually a committee member. Um, I know he was in attendance online, but I think that needs um, altering. Yes, indeed. I'm sure we can arrange for that to be corrected before the final minutes. At page two, on page two, Councillor Rickard, you've been reading well. Um, in paragraph, the second full paragraph on page two down, um, health and licensing team, um, licensing should really be with an S because it's like a verbal sense of the word. Thank you. At page three, and page four. Um, on page four, fourth paragraph down, the third whole paragraph down, just a semicolon between Dr. Richard Williams's name, which we need to remove that. Oh, indeed. Yes, on the first line of that paragraph. Thank you very much. Um, subject to those, members, those amendments, is it your wish that I should sign them as a true record? Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. So now we move on to item 
five, which is public questions. Uh, Mr. Ian Senior, can you tell me, do we have any public questions, please? Uh, not today, not today, Chair. Thank you very much. And so we move on to item six, which is the draft reset and recovery plan. And I would like to invite the council leader uh, to address this report, if you would, please. Leader. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Um, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Anne Ainsworth, uh, the Chief Operating Officer, who has uh, really uh, put in the lion's share of the work on this, uh, this reset and recovery plan. Um, so I'm very pleased to bring it to scrutiny. I'm glad you've asked for early sight of this. As members will be aware, uh, we're at a critical junction now, um, the 19th of uh, this month, um, you know, signaled that we were moving into uh, the recovery phase for the last um, 18 plus months. And it's really critical that we uh, consider how we focus our resources on the coming months. Who counts the weight of that? I'm sorry to interrupt you one moment. Can I just ask that everyone else is muted? We lost your sound for just a few seconds there. Would you okay, mind um, going back to the start of that last sentence, please? Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Yes, sorry. I, the background noise wasn't coming from me. But no. uh, Okay, so um, obviously the, the 19th of this month was a very critical date. Uh, it, you know, the government has now formally moved us into the uh, reset and recovery phase of the pandemic which has plagued us for so very many months. Um, you know, there are concerns there because obviously numbers of people suffering from COVID are going up, but you know, it is, we, we have to start, start focusing on the future, both on what we're going to do in the coming months, but most likely in the coming years actually, because recovery isn't something that's going to uh, happen in a short period of time. So, you know, our focus has to be helping our residents and our communities and our businesses to recover. And this plan covers actions, both those which we are directly responsible for, but also actions that can only come about through partnership working. And one of the, uh, the few positives that's come out of the pandemic has been greatly improved partnership working between us, the County Council, health, police, fire, public health. And, you know, I've been participating in these meetings on a, on a weekly basis. And I know our, our chief exec and our chief operating officer have been in these meetings daily. And it's, it's a, an incredible change in the way we, are, you know, everybody now acknowledges that we are all in this together and we all absolutely have to work together. So it's critical that we capture all the, the positives in this partnership working. And I think everybody everybody realizes that. So it's very much cabinet's um, wish and cabinet have, have, very, have had um, one, uh, one opportunity to talk about this very early draft of this strategy. And it was cabinet's wish that it was very much focused around people. And so efforts have been made to reflect what we have been hearing from our communities and from our businesses and from those partners who I've just uh, referenced. Now, obviously, this plan sits alongside the council's business plan and our medium term financial plan. And it's intended to focus on those actions that are specific to the impact of the pandemic and not on the business as usual or the actions which are already reflected in other plans. So this is new work, work that we most likely wouldn't be doing if we hadn't been experiencing a pandemic for the last 18 months. Um, and we also, it's also really important to me in particular uh, that the plan focuses on actions that are deliverable. We don't just want um, mother, motherhood and apple pie. We've got to actually be delivering things that make a difference to the lives of our residents, our communities and our businesses. Um, so you can see that the action plan is very much a work in progress. And uh, one of the reasons we're very pleased that you've asked for early, in, early sight of this is that we welcome free scrutiny here and we welcome your opportunity to shape this, um, help us decide uh, whether there's any gaps, uh, whether there's anything that shouldn't be there, but also how we, how we should be prioritizing things 
within this within this action plan. So, you know, this this is just a draft, and um, I, I think it's probably clear to you that this is very much uh, something that's still in development, and we do expect it to change over the coming weeks. Uh, so, we did not want to bring a final document to scrutiny um, because. You know, because we, we do pre-scrutiny in this council and what would be the point in bringing you something that was already cast in stone. So, you know, I hope this reflects our commitment to pre-scrutiny. Pre um, this, this has got to be the council's uh, reset and recovery plans, not, not, the, just, not just the Liberal Democrats. This has got to be the council's. It's got to be something that works for all of our communities, all of our businesses and all of our residents. And we've all gone through this pandemic together. And I think as a council cross party, we've worked incredibly well together. And I think we have some, uh, some fabulous examples of uh, everybody, everybody pulling their weight to the nth degree. So as I did mention, a previous draft uh, did go to cabinet to comment on. And actually after that, uh, there was quite a sort of major, major rewrite of it because we wanted it to be far more far more outcome focused and far more far more people focused and actually what you're seeing now is quite a slimmed down version from what was first presented to us so um with your uh with your permission chair i would like just to hand over to Anne Ainsworth so she can just go through a little more detail please of what got us to this point thank you very much indeed thank you leader um, over to you thank you chair thank you leader um, so, just a, a couple of additional points and, and questions for members. So, oh, speak up. Is that better? Oh, is that better? Thank you. Um, so, in terms of uh, putting this document together, there's been quite a lot of thinking um, that's gone into this, as, as you would expect to see. Alongside other organisations across the county and nationally, lots of people are putting together uh, some form of a recovery plan following the pandemic. And I'm sure you will have already seen some examples from across the country and perhaps from local councils. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having difficulty hearing, Anne. Still, if you could bring your mic closer, that might sort of be helpful. Thank you. Is that better? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so, as I was saying, there's lots of examples of recovery plans um, in development across the country and also locally as well. So when we've been putting um, this plan together, this, this early draft, as the leader has mentioned, we've been talking with our neighbouring councils, um, with our partners, to, to find out what they're doing as well, to make sure that we're not acting in splendid isolation in the development of this plan. And I think that the two kind of aspects that you can see within this document are actions that we would be directly responsible for as a council, but as the leader has said, also actions that involve partnership. Um, and that is being reflected, I think, in the ongoing work of others as well. Um, this document has involved uh, input from officers from across the council. Uh, we took it to our management team. At that point in time, as you can imagine, with a document like this that has had so much, um, the pandemic has impacted our society in so many different ways, we had a lot of actions and ideas and proposals that officers were putting forward. Um, so we have thinned this document down considerably. And we did ask officers um, what they thought the priorities should be and where they wanted to focus. One of the steers that we, that we got when we took this to cabinet members was to focus on actions that weren't business as usual, as the leader has mentioned, and things that were over and above what we were already doing. Uh, there are a couple of actions in there that you may recognize from other documents, and that is uh, areas where we've talked as colleagues, as, as officers, to say, well, if this is something that we think we should still have in a recovery plan, is it something that we would add additional value to, that we could stretch, that we could take further? So not a duplication of what's already existing, but I suppose an evolution in that sense of, of the actions. But we have tried to, to focus on things um, that are different. They still sit alongside the business plan um, and the financial plan. We have sought to avoid any duplication and really focus on actions which are relevant 
to the acute issues that we know have, have come to the fore as part of the pandemic. If there are any gaps, though, um, we'd very much welcome comments from members on that. Obviously, in thinning documents down, there are things that you can lose as part of that process. And if members feel that there are things that we should add back in, uh, we would welcome any comments on that. One of the things with partners, um, and I mentioned the conversations that we've been having, one of the things that's been coming out from partners is that nobody wants to lose the developing relationships and, and the trust and the activities that we've been able to engage in through the pandemic. And everyone agrees that we want to keep that level of partnership working and communication and relationships really high as we move forward. So we, we've attempted to reflect that within this draft. Um, and then I think just the one last thing I would say is I recognise at the moment in the action plan that some of the actions are less clear than others. Um, and I would expect members to have noticed that as well. Some of that is around this um, developing aspect about partnerships. So we may not be in a position yet to say exactly what we would do, but we wanted to put markers in the ground where we felt that there are important activities um, that address some of the acute needs that we've seen coming through the pandemic. And so we can continue to explore them um, in, when we're looking at further iterations of this document. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Anne. So I'll now uh, open the meeting up to members. And I'm going to start with Councillor Claire Daunt. Speak to Walmart. There we are. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, yeah, so th thank you very much for the document. I'm really glad that we have such early sight of it. Um, I've just got two linked questions, both of them really to do with resources. Um, so it's good to see the partnership working continuing. So that will, will that be a genuine sharing of resources across the partnerships, the input of um, financial and human resources? Um, and secondly, linked to that, during the pandemic, of course, we had enormous support from a huge number of volunteers across the district, um, inevitably unpaid volunteers. Um, and they did an awful lot of work to help us deal with the pandemic. So. Um, are we going to continue that work either through the volunteers or in another form? Thank you, Claire. Uh, Are you taking that on or is the leader? Uh, uh, so, so uh, Chair, if I, if I may have a first stab yes, and then um, ask Anne to, uh, to support me. Um, so we, on the, the sharing of uh, resources with our partnerships, I think that's very much a work in progress. And I think the County Council are leading on kind of putting a model together for, that, for how that would, would work. Um, but I'll ask Anne to talk about some detail on that. Um, in regards to the volunteer support, uh, you know, I, I, I think like many of you have been a volunteer in my community for decades now. And, you know, what COVID has shown us is that, um, you know, there is an opportunity here to capture this, this increased uh, volunteer effort in our communities, which will not just serve us well during this recovery phase, but will serve our communities well, you know, forevermore, particularly in making our communities more resilient. So, when something else happens, or, or, you know, something else will have it be it happen, be it, you know, flood, feast or famine or whatever, uh, you know, the communities will be in a better state to deal with it. So, you know, we had to build up capacity in a very short period of time. And South Cambridgeshire was extraordinary because I think every single village had a volunteer uh, force in place within three weeks of us asking people to mobilise. But they're getting tired now, and we know from uh, things that you as members are telling us and from what we're getting back from the volunteer service that, you know, these numbers are beginning to drop off. So what, what I would really value from Scrutiny is suggestions about what we can do to help keep those volunteer workforces in place and perhaps uh, get them to move from... Uh, you know, this, this kind of emergency phase they've been in now into a recovery phase and then into something else, um, you know, for, for the future. 
and the problem with communities, which again, most of you, because I'm sure you're all volunteers, know is that you know the same people pop up on the same committee. So I did toy library, play group, tennis club, you know, same people going through everything. But you know, we, we've got new people now volunteering and there's, I think those people have found it a hugely rewarding as well as a hugely exhausting experience. So if you have suggestions about what we can do to help those volunteers stay active in their communities, that would be much appreciated. Um, if I could just bring in Anne to just talk a little bit more about uh, the, the resource sharing, be it financial or human resource, uh, moving forward into more partnership working, that would be great. Thank you, Linda. And if you would, Joanne. Thank you. Um, so what I would say on the partnership side is it's very, very early days, um, but the conversations that we're having at the moment, um, everybody that, that I speak to is committed to keeping that really strong way of working moving forward. I think one of the challenges that we will have, um, it, it, ironically in a way, is that the pandemic has given everybody uh, what you would describe as a burning platform. So everyone has focused upon, upon a, essentially a single priority. And the conversations that we're having now is how do we keep that energy and that momentum and that, um, that high level of trust and engagement communication across the partners in what is a complex partnership landscape how do we keep that moving um, when we will begin to return almost to a business as usual type of state where we may have different priorities as organizations? So what we've been uh, talking about, again, very, very early stages is what might those shared priorities be? Where are those areas that we would want to work together? And um, you know, so far, those conversations have, have taken the shape of, well, let's just explore everything and anything and then see what might be the best way of working together on that. So I'm not hearing at the moment that anything is off the table, but, but we're at very early stages. Thank you very much. Um, if the members in the chamber would permit me, I, we have a couple of questions from our members on Teams. Um, so I'd like to take the remote questions first of all. And I'll start with, if I may, Councillor Steve Hunt, please. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the for the report. It's, uh, it's obviously a very important thing for us to be thinking about. It's great to see it early. Um, just a few comments or questions. I didn't really see any link in here to the local plan, and I wondered if it should reference it in some way to, to somehow talk about what things can be baked into the local plan that might help us both in the immediate you know, in the immediate future, in the in the long term future, in terms of having a community that is resilient to any future outbreaks of this type, um, and and sort of similarly, perhaps there are parts of this which are clearly tactical things to do now to recover, and other bits which would be further reaching policy that we want to set in place to stand us in good stead of the future, and it would sort of be quite nice to see that more explicitly acknowledged in the document somehow, or perhaps there is a different document which should be co covering that, that more strategic, longer reaching part. Um, just one sort of specific question is on page 14 or rather our page, what is it, 22, um, under rebuild a thriving economy, we have identified businesses who would benefit from significant startup scale up financial backing advice. Um, but I couldn't see what, you know, well, all right, we identify them, but then what? I mean, is there a plan to actually to actually fund those? And, uh, and and what form does that take? And where's the money coming from? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed. So, uh, so Chair, if I, if I may. Um, your point, um, Councillor Hunt, about a link to the local plan is a really interesting one. And um, we've, I'd like us to take, take that away because it certainly relates to things like uh, community facilities and making sure that, uh, you know, perhaps through the local plan, uh, there's more of uh, more emphasis into the provision of uh, those sort of community facilities, which really come into their own in building in this resilience. So thank you very much for that. That's, uh, that's really helpful. Um, and again, you asked for sort of greater clarity over uh, the sort of short term tactical actions and sort of longer term policy decisions. Again, I think we need to take that away, but Anne might like to comment on that. And in relation to businesses, 
Um, so, I mean, we, we were very fortunate that we were, we, by the time the pandemic hit us, I think we had already recruited most of our business uh, support team. So, you know, that was, that was quite lucky, actually, because we all, you know, we had experts who really understood businesses and business support. Um, and our, so we, we now have a team of four people. But I think, you know, at the height of giving out all the grants, I think they were joined by about 20 more officers because there was just so much work to do. So, you know, obviously, identifying uh, what, what ongoing support businesses need is the first stage. And then, you know, once we've identified what, what that support they need, then we need to be talking about what we, what we do ourselves. Uh, so, you know, we've run, run umpteen webinars. Um, businesses have a single point of contact within the council, uh, you know, copious amounts, amounts of advice. But also, you know, we're not the only player here. So, as you know, we work closely with the Chamber of Commerce and the, Federa uh, the Federation of Small Business. So, you know, what should we be kind of passing on to them, signposting them? What can we be doing with them? And then, of course, the other major player is the combined authority. Um, and, you know, they, they are the people with the money in reality. And their business board, um, you know, well, has its own recovery plan. I can't the top of my head remember what stage it's at at the moment um, so I think you know we need to we need to focus initially on what it is the South Cambridgeshire businesses need what that what state they're in what the threats are they're facing and then we need the second piece of the work is to be talking to our partners to see what they are going to do with us what they are going to do independently and then my hope would be, if there's anything left over, we then find a way of picking it, picking that up ourselves. Um, at, may I bring in Anne, please? Um, yes, of course. Thank you. Oh. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, just to say on, on that issue of kind of tactical actions versus policy and strategy, we can draw we can draw that out more. So thank you, thank you for that comment. Um, and just on the final point about the the action related to businesses. So this this was an action that came from the business team. And they wanted us to include this as something that they felt was important to recovery moving forward. Um, we can obviously firm up this action and talk a bit more about the how, but I know that this is something that they're looking to do as part of our COVID response. We want to make sure that businesses that have uh, the potential to grow, that we can identify them earlier and support them with our partners. Um, and the leader also mentioned the, uh, the recovery plan from the combined authority. That's the, uh, the local economic recovery strategy. It was drafted, the first draft came out last autumn and then they did a review of that in March. Um, and that's obviously a, a document that we have reviewed as part of putting together this draft of our recovery strategy um, so that the, the, the two work together and uh, should work together moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, my other question, my other remote question is from Councillor Cathcart. Well, I can't see him at the moment. Nigel, oh. are you with us? <laughs> I, I think I'm there. Um, yes, you are. I can see you. Please go ahead. Okay, yes. No, just, um, it, it's really, I think it's touched on here. This is a question of changes in, in working practices. It may... No, I'm sorry, Nigel. We have lost you completely. So I'll come, I'll come back to you shortly. In yeah. the meantime, could we go to Councillor Anna Bradman, please? Thank, Thank you for being Chairman. so patient. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, for the purposes of the minutes, I noticed that Councillor Harvey managed to join us just prior to the presentation which, which the leader started on this paper. That's very kind. So he Thank was you. part of the meeting. I know he can't vote because he's remote, but um, he was here. Thank you. And was that it? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Thane. P Councillor Peter Thane. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it is, as was said, very useful to have early sight of this, but I think we have to also recognise that we are to some extent playing catch-up here. We're meeting the day after, in theory, the pandemic turned into thingemic, as we've probably become both now, um, and therefore plans for reset and recovery need to be, uh, frankly, well underway. Now, I recognise we're not hanging around waiting for this document or anything, and indeed, there was reference to the local economic uh, recovery strategy. 
to some extent, it seems to me, perhaps we should be focusing on the LERS uh, and our part in that, uh, particularly since, as uh, the leader said, they have the money. Um, but turning to page 21, um, forgive me, I know this will be apparent to everyone, but there are various blanks. The timeline, who is responsible, how we will know when this has been achieved, those are very important questions and perhaps some indication of some answers might have been helpful there. I mean, the timeline, are we talking about May 2022, which is perhaps a date that some of us are rather keen focused on, or are we talking about a more realistic period for officers and for the council as a whole? Who is responsible? Because clearly we will not assume this is maybe all falls back on the chief operating officer, um, or indeed officers as a whole, because clearly it's something where councillors have a role to, and as I mentioned, are part in the LERS. I think if we're going to know when this has been achieved, it's very important to quantify now what the current status is. Otherwise, how do we measure whether that's improved? So, for instance, we talk on page 17, many people have lost their jobs or at risk of unemployment. I'm afraid we need to quantify that. We need to quantify the situation on housing supply and accessibility on page 18. Um, we need to say how uh, we will work with education colleagues at the county council. Um, a number of questions which I'm sure are no surprise to the officers who've worked so hard on this, but I think it's difficult to make useful comments with, without that. So I do think it is going to be quite urgent for Cabinet to move this forward and to fill in a few of the gaps in this document. And meanwhile, in the spirit of partnership, I think, to focus on our role within the LERS. Thank you, Peter. Leader. Uh, so thank, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, the local industrial strategy is business as usual. This isn't business as usual. This is, this is exceptional stuff. That's hap that we need to do as a result of the, the pandemic. But, you know, you are quite right, Councillor Fane, we mustn't lose sight of the local industrial strategy. And, you know, the, the, the effect of the pandemic isn't the only thing we're dealing with. We're, you know, I sit in quite a lot of meetings from the East of England Local Government Association, where they are doing a lot of work on what the actual effects of Brexit is as well. So, you know, we've got that to manage, or manage also. Um, in relation, so I, can't, I agree with you completely that this is really, really urgent. Um, but you know, we are in, we're in this kind of interim phase when we are still dealing with a, a, a national, international health emergency with our figures going up all the time. So that that still has to be managed because we don't yet know if we're going to be facing another another lockdown or goodness knows what. Everything's going. Everything's going the wrong way. I mean, what I saw yesterday was uh, was deeply, deeply concerning. So it's very challenging to be dealing with an ongoing crisis situation at the same time as trying to, you know, manage the, uh, the recovery from it. Now, because of that, you know, we, uh, as a thing, you were asking for, you know, evidence of how many people have lost their jobs, how many businesses have got, gone under and so on. You know, we don't know. You know, we don't know what the final picture is going to be. And we don't know how long it's going to take for the effect of the pandemic to finally play out. You know, the last person loses their job as a direct, you know, a consequence of the pandemic. You know, is that going to be next month? Is it going to be this time next year? Is it going to be 18, 18 months time? Now, I know that there's a lot of work going on in compiling an, ep an evidence base to sit alongside this piece of work, um, and that's been cross-referenced with actions that are detailed in other people's plans. And, but this is a work in progress, and it's not in a state to share currently, but it is the intention that this evidence base, when complete, albeit that will be a pretty dynamic document, I would think, um, will form an appendix to the final, the final draft of this. Um, so I would appeal to members if there is any evidence which you're aware of which can contribute to, to this, uh, then please do give it to us. And in relation to um, Councillor Fane's challenge about uh, you know, the timeline, again, that's something that I, I hope we would get from this, this meeting, that you would be saying to us, well, actually, you know, this... Uh, you know, un under, let's say, rebuild a thriving economy, um, you know, identifying businesses who would benefit, 
is the most important thing. So some feedback from you on what we should be prioritizing because you know we have limited human resources and we can't do everything at once. Um, but you know it's, we would we rely on our, our experts, our officers, on our partners, but very, very much so on our members to be giving us a clear steer on what those priorities should be and help help us put that timeline together. Um, I don't know if Anne wants to add anything to that. One point. Yes, uh, the leader referred to the local industrial strategy. I perhaps wasn't speaking clearly. I was referring to the local economic recovery strategy specifically, which is the youth operating officer has mentioned. My, apolo my apologies. It's, it's, it's quite difficult to hear. My apologies. But uh, yeah, quite, a, quite agree, Councillor Fain. Absolutely. Thank you, leader. Um, over to you. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, thank you for the comments. Um, uh, obviously, you're absolutely right about the action plan. Um, it's very much a work in progress, and, uh, and so we would welcome any comments on that. In terms of the timings of the documents, um, what we and, and quite a lot of our neighbouring councils have been focused on, obviously, is the response to, to COVID to date, and we're still working on that now. I think it's interesting as we're moving from a response to a recovery phase, and there's lots of debate about whether recovery is the right word, but what we're essentially trying to do is move out of a pandemic and into more of an endemic situation and reflect that within the various aspects of our society, so the economy and communities, etc., that have been affected by it. We can look at whether we could strengthen the link between those two within the document. I think that might be useful and help to tell the story a little bit better. Um, but I would like to provide some reassurance in the sense that from a timing perspective, we're not out of kilter with others. They're also developing their plans over the summer as well. There's been some initial work from some of our neighbouring councils, um, which you know, if you do a Google search, that they'll come up, you'll be able to see that. But um, the plans themselves are actually still in development. So that's quite helpful because you can work together and talk together about what those plans look like not least where they, they mention partnership working, and of course we are referring to, to each other working in partnership in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can we go back now to Councillor Nigel Cathcart? Nigel, um, we, we lost you yeah, uh, last time. No, time. just, I mean, just uh, we've talked in the, the program which is very valid about changes in working practices, and I suspect many of the, some people will go back to what they were doing before, quite a lot may not, so you've got to get a fundamental change in the way people will behave in their working practices um, and we will have to find some way to look at it, even if we a local plan or something else. As well as that, there has been damage to people's sense of confidence and their sense of well-being. And I think anything that we can do, this is probably long term, that would actually facilitate that sort of improvement. One thing that springs to mind is, for instance, the public footpaths within our villages, some of which are neglected and some of which are not. But also, uh, and to some extent, this pandemic should give us impetus to do things that perhaps we haven't given the authority in the past. The other thing is, of course, the footpaths between villages. Um, in many cases, there was an ambitious scheme some years ago to link up our villages by a series of footpaths. Now, there's better, nothing better to a sense of well-being and uh, renewal than to actually walk from one village to another. Uh, in the past, of course, people just got into their cars and driven all over the place. Now, there may be a change in, in practices which we can look at. So, what I'm saying is this is an example of perhaps quite a fundamental shift in the way people do things and in the way people um, enjoy their recreation and their sort of out, of out of office life. Because a number of people in my village have said, actually, I used to get into a train and spend two hours each day. Uh, on, and I was get, get, getting back exhausted. I now have far more time on my hands, in fact, to do things perhaps I would have liked to have done. Um, so we actually need to look at that. Is this as part of the recovery plan. How do we actually engage with people to actually use their time constructively and such? So I think there are some very, very fundamental issues that perhaps the recovery plan can only touch on, but actually could actually provide a, a direction of travel, you know, especially working closely with other agencies and parties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Leela. Uh, so thank you very much, Councillor Cathcart. So it's nice that somebody points out the positives of the pandemic. And I must say, one of the few things that's kept me uh, reasonably sane has been being able to walk. And I'm really, really lucky that there's, uh, there's good footpaths um, where, where I live. Uh, so I think that's an important point. And obviously, um, 
you know, the, the county council, I think, is responsible for the majority of the footpaths, but, you know, they are a partner of ours. And it could mean that sort of maintaining footpaths and creating new footpaths as part of our local plan, which was one of the very first questions uh, this mm -hmm. evening, um, you know, it, it kind of goes up our list of priorities, because as you quite rightly say, being able to get out into the countryside and walk is very, very beneficial to people's well-being and to their physical health, their mental health, uh, but also to, to the environment. So I think you make a very, a very good point there. And in relation to uh, changing working practice, obviously um, Liz Watts, as the um, head of paid service here, is uh, very engaged with our own officers. Um, and I know isn't in a hurry to bring people back in back into the office until we are absolutely sure that everyone's safe. And even then, you know, it, it's going to look different. It's not going to look the way it did look. So I know the combined authority are doing a lot of work um, trying to identify what uh, what the new work practice might look like. Because apart from anything, it will impact on a lot of the combined authority schemes. So you know, do you need to be uh, building new roads? Do you need to be, how many buses do you need to be putting on to, to cater for the new, the new way of working? So a lot of these things are unknowns, uh, but which we have to be working with partners in order to, to be part of the decision making. And a lot of that will play into both our local plan, but also into the um, non-statutory spatial framework, which the Oxford, Oxford Cambridge Arc are going to be launching in the next few days. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair, um, and um, thank you, um, Leader, for, for bringing this to the committee. Um, I mean, I, I welcome a lot of what was said um, in, in the Leader's opening remarks about working on a cross-party basis and this being a policy for the Council. I would certainly um, support that. And obviously, there are many things in this policy that, that I would support and I think are very good. And I would pick up, for example, the reference to expanding the mobile warden scheme. So, so there are lots of things in here which I think are good and I certainly applaud the intention and I certainly applaud um, the effort. But I, I do have some concerns um, and, and essentially they relate to the extent to which this policy sets itself some potentially very broad um, objectives, or at least it makes some very broad statements, and those statements are not really borne out necessarily in the action plan. So my overall point would be that I think there could be some work done to sort of scale this down, but particularly link the text to the action plan. And I just wanted to flag up a few points where I, I don't really think those things um, tie up. So on page 17, for example, we say we want to stop businesses that are thriving pre-COVID from now failing and that we need to be quick and agile in our response. Now, that's a huge ambition to stop businesses failing. And as a district council, we simply don't have the necessary tools to be able to really do that effectively. But perhaps more importantly, there is no reference um, to anything really that could be linked to that objective in the Rebuild a Thriving Economy action plan. So there's nothing really that, that, that follows that up. Similarly, a little bit further down on page 17, we say that we want to support education providers to provide courses that enable young people to re-enter the job market as soon as possible. I mean, that's potentially very expensive if we're going to start giving direct financial aid to education providers. But again, there's no reference to that at all in the Rebuilding a Thriving Economy action plan. Um, so that's not referenced there at all. On the other hand, the rebuilding a thriving economy does say we're going to develop a cultural strategy for the district. Now, that may be a very valuable thing, something that I think probably is a very valuable thing, but there's no reference to that at all in the rebuilding the thriving economy text. Um, so it sort of comes from nowhere, and, and, and it's not clear how that would relate. Um, and then just one final one. I won't go through them all, but there are others. Um, when we, on page 18, we talk about ensuring that housing of different tenures and affordability are brought forward for development. Um, now, we just can't really control what's brought forward for development for the district council. We can only really deal with the planning applications that we, that we get. But again, there's nothing really on that in the action plan under this section. There is a reference in the strengthening relationships to, to 106s. Um, 
but there's actually nothing in the action plan about how we might ensure um, that a mix of housing is brought forward because we can't really do that. Um, so whilst I applaud the intention behind this, and I do think there are some good things in there, and I, you know, I, I flagged up one of them, I do think this needs to be refocused and perhaps thought through about what's achievable and how the text matches up with, with, with what's in the action plan. Thank you. Thank you. Leader. Uh, so, so thank you very much. So those are all, all very valid points. Um, so, you know, I th as I said in my introduction, this document is incomplete. Um, you know, we have brought it to you deli deliberately early. Um, and it's very helpful to hear uh, Councillor Williams about, you know, what you want, um, what things you want to be more clearly identified in the as, as positive deliverable actions. Um, so a lot of these things are things we're doing, we're doing with with partners and you know we can't until we've done the work with the partner it's difficult to say exactly what those actions are going to be because it's not just us who are making that decision so you talked about um a little bit talking about business failure and we you know we want to uh, minimize the number of business failures and okay we can't we can't save every business but, you know, as a district council, you know, we do know our businesses and, you know, in this side of the pandemic, we actually know our businesses a heck of a lot better than we ever did before. We have enormous amount of data on our businesses. And I think a lot of us have actually made direct contact with all our businesses. So we have a lot of intelligence there. Um, and we, you know, we have had access to millions and millions of pounds of government money, which we have disseminated to those businesses. And uh, I think there's, there's recently been some more, some more money. So I think we've been very, very active in preventing business business failures. We've been, we have had discretionary money to give uh, to hand out, and we focused that discretionary money on businesses which had a future post pandemic. Um, but which weren't going to survive without any, any intervention. So considerable work going into that. Um, education, again, you know, we, uh, we sit on the skills board of the combined authority and the combined authority handles all the skills money. So through that partnership, we will be able to influence courses that are available for young people to get them into the workplace, a post pandemic workplace, again, which we don't know what it's going to look like. Um, I know there's some members who feel very passionately about the council being more involved in cultural strategies and particularly through our local plan. And again, you know, that I think the if we're talking about people's health and well-being and community resilience, you know, we know we now know how important that is. I've just booked for theatre. God, I'm so excited. I haven't been to the theatre for nearly nearly two years. You know, it's been a it's been a real a huge hole. You know, it's the icing on it's the icing on the cake. We've, well, we've been left with bread and dripping, really. We haven't even had the cake recently. Um, and on the housing, actually, you know, actually, I disagree with you, Councillor Williams. We can influence a mix of housing, and I think we can ensure a mix of housing. Um, and certainly, you know, both through our own policies and our own local plan, um, but also through the um, our very, very significant involvement with the Oxford Cambridge Arc where their spatial, uh, spatial framework, their spatial plan, is going to have policies which are embedded in national planning policy. So, you know, there are, opportun there are opportunities for us to be able to live up to the ambition of ensuring a mix of housing that reflects the needs of our, our community. Um, uh, Councillor, uh, Chair, may, may Anne Ainsworth come in and add anything to that, please? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Yes, thank you for those comments. I, I think in some cases, um, we need to have a look at the drafting again. Um, so, for example, around things like supporting people to re-enter the job market, one of the actions we've got is a very specific action about our own recruitment um, and the way that the council can act as an employer within that space. Um, but, but I can see that we, we can strengthen the links between the things that we mention in the narrative document and, and then the actions themselves as well. So we will look at that. Thanks, and I do believe that Councillor Williams would like to come back. Yes, thank you. Just, just very quickly, um, just on that last point, Leader, I mean, okay, if you want to argue that you can um, influence the housing mix that's brought forward for development, 
then I think the, my key point really is that we need to know how. I think we need some specifics in the action plan on exactly what you're planning to do um, to um, live up to that, that promise rather than to, to state it in the text uh, and then there not really be anything specific about that in the, uh, in the action plan. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, Councillor Williams, and uh, we will do that. Thank you very much. Councillor Martin Carr. Thank you. It's very interesting. Uh, I was going to come back to my, uh, about the point about the cultural strategy again, which uh, I'm one of the people that's also been interested in this. Uh, but it also relates to the whole issue about uh, green spaces and access, uh, countryside park, uh, access to the countryside. Um, this council in the past, uh, when we constrained upon uh, our, uh, our rates, our, our rate rates, and tried to cut back on uh, spending, who has withdrawn basically from all action on virtually all action on the cultural side and virtually all action on on, on the recreational side, it's, it's been devolved to other organisations. Uh, uh, even passed the only land we had, uh, suitable land we had, the Milford Country Park Act, to another body to manage. So we've rather opted out. Now, if we're going to have a cultural strategy, I'd like to know if this is going to include, uh, it means building more upper sections to deal with these fields, uh, uh, both, both access to the countryside uh, uh, and that, while the highway, the county is responsible as a highway authority for the act of keeping footballs open, promotion and make, encouraging use and provision of green space, uh, access space is a district council function as well as a county council function. And in fact, we're the only district in Cambridge which doesn't have a park park service which we have our own um, so it's uh, something which we've opted out of uh, I won't go back upon the reasons but that's where we are now getting new services into our local authority is an awful job difficult job because it means new expenditure new expenditure and it also means looking at the structure of the authority because basically services that are supplied tend to have a structure supporting them within the authority and if you don't have a a section dealing with culture within the authority, you can say what you like, very little will take place. Uh, that, that's my experience of working in a local authority, that's the way that the power politics work in local authorities. And the same with terms of recreation and access to countryside into the, that, that side of it. So I want to know within, I, I think the pandemic has provided a very good justification for getting back into those fields. It's highlighted how important they are and that we should be taking action. I would like to see something in this about how we're going to actually do that in more detail, uh, thinking about what the implications are that the, uh, uh, if this is going to be have a higher priority. What, what, how do you see that going forward? Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Khan. Well, you know, it's, it's not impossible to embed new services. Um, you know, three and a half years ago, there was no business support service in this council. So, you know, with, with will and, uh, and careful financing, it's quite possible to do that. So, obviously, um, saying that we'll, we will have a cultural strategy is uh, it's not something that's going to be knocked off by, by next Wednesday. This is a big piece of, big piece of work. Um, and I think what we need to do is kind of break it down into, you know, what could we be doing in the short term to start um, providing, opp providing opportunities uh, for our residents or perhaps for community groups to uh, start uh, doing doing their bit to be um, engaging their residents more. Obviously, you know, a lot of our community groups um, have been fo focused on COVID. So the little charity that I've run for the last goodness knows how many years, we know we used to run annual Battle of the Bands competitions. Now, obviously, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, but you know, perhaps perhaps there are little things we can do by perhaps reprioritizing some of our grant programs to uh, giving small amounts of money to community groups to start stimulating culture and the arts in their community. So again, some suggestions from you about what some low hanging fruit would be, would be really helpful because what I don't, what I don't want is for us to wait until we've, uh, we've developed a whole big cultural strategy, which will take ages and might well not be a priority while people are still suffering from COVID and our hospital beds are still full up. But you know, what are some early actions that we could do that might just start sowing some seeds um, with, with our communities to make stuff start happening sooner rather than later? Thank you, Leader. It's Councillor Sarah Chung-Johnson. Sarah. 
Hi, thank you. Um, so again, I echo what other uh, fellow members of the scrutiny committee have uh, pointed out, that this is a very um, ambitious plan, and thank you for putting it together. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the under strengthen our relationships and new ways of working where uh, point two, ensuring that section 106 and healthcare planning reflect the health and community needs of new and expanding communities. And here I am speaking as a councillor of one of the biggest new and expanding communities um, that is expanding fast, um, but with no real sight of its own GP on the horizon. So I'm just wondering how realistic it is other than us saying, isn't it lovely to have, um, how much power and influence we have to actually make that happen, given that we face that issue now locally, um, and we don't seem to be getting much traction on it. Thank you. There you go. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Chair. So, you know, what, what COVID has done has, you know, shone a, a shone a bright light on the fact that um, pe people have to, um, sorry, I've got a message saying you see a TV screen behind me. Um, sorry about that. Um, that, you know, the people who have fared best are the young, the, you know, the fit and healthy, the people without underlying, underlying health conditions and so on. So, you know, we have to do more to make our communities resilient to get people fit and healthy to make sure that they have access to the primary health care they need which you you've referenced councillor chung johnson which i know is a, a big problem in in your patch um but you know for the first time since you know the last three years since i've been doing this job we now have a close relationship with public health and with the nhs and that we didn't have that before quite honestly here and you know those are those are probably amongst the most important newly strengthened relations that we build upon um on top of which you know the combined authority is beginning to uh, fo focus itself on health issues as well so i think there are there are opportunities there um you know if our if our residents are not active don't have access to you know the best in health care aren't eating good fresh food and so on you know when something else like this happens they're going to fare as badly or worse and they have this time um so you know we as a council we've been engaged with the whole obesity agenda you know goodness me 10 years if not if not more more than 10 years but i think what this has done has has made us realise that we need to be reprioritising some of the some of this stuff really. Um, so you know, feedback, your feedback will will help us help us do that. And some of it we can try and do alone. And I know all of our kind of active um, active travel work and the the work we do uh, on sport and so on. You know, we do alone. But there's there's got to be better opportunities to do things together. Um, I'm rambling slightly, so I'm going to ask Anne Ainsworth to, uh, to come in, actually, to ramble less than I am. Oh. I, I'm not sure there's, there's much I would, I would add, really, Chair. I think in the conversations that we've had um, as officers, obviously what we recognise is the importance of the process around Section 106 is, um, and, and looking to you know, make sure that all aspects of the council and partners are engaged with that process moving forward. Um, I'm sure there are some lessons we can learn, and this also relates to um, the partnership working you mentioned earlier with partners such as the County Council. Thank you very much. Councillor Aidan van der Weyer, please. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor, so this um, recovery strategy, I think, is an excellent initiative, um, uh, really welcome. Um, I, and I, I think um, uh, doing a uh, strategy like this uh, in, in an ambitious way uh, without every detail nailed down is entirely appropriate uh, for this extreme situation that we, our residents and our businesses find ourselves in. Um, uh, I have um, a couple of questions that relating to partnership working, which we have talked about a bit, which I, I think is really good. Um, obviously, a, a lot of the, the um, objectives in this, and especially the more ambitious ones, um, uh, can only really be achieved with partners um, who are working toward, to the same ends. Um, uh, obviously, as we've discussed, um, the uh, partnership working over the last 18 months has greatly improved, uh, and, and um, the way that this strategy seeks to um, uh, learn from that, strengthen what's good, uh, I think is great. Um, 
Pam uh, said early on that, that about um, the the, um, the the need to sort of consciously uh, ensure that as we move from the sort of the um, sort of um, emergency situation where everyone's sort of focusing on the, on the same objective to to a more business usual where, where other priorities of different organisations come in. Um, uh, what sort of discussions um, uh, um, have there been around around how to manage that, um, both at officer and political level? Because obviously the those, the issue of competing priorities uh, is as much a, a political thing. Um, so first question and um, second question: um, You said um, um, yesterday at the early on that there are other organisations that are doing similar things. Um, I'm just wondering. Um, uh, where some of those organisations were, in so far as you, you're sort of aware at the moment, obviously there's, there's a lot, uh, and in particular in, in relation to, to some of these um, ambitious things that, that um, we're looking at, are, are, are those other organisations going to be um, uh, developing similar similar policies? I mean, the, the um, uh, we've already mentioned the culture strategy and the identifying businesses. Uh, the other one that, that jumped up to me is a very interesting, ambitious, uh, but, but really good if, it, if we can do it and it doesn't depend on uh, partnerships is the uh, digital inclusion skills program um, so are they going to be um, included in, in sort of uh, um, sort of corresponding documents thank you thank you Lida. yeah th thank you councillor van der Weyer. um so sorry, the, it was really difficult to hear you so i'm hope, hoping i captured uh, what what you said so you are you wanting to know about what other um, organizations are doing similar plans to, to ours and what political level conversations have there been happening um, to make sure that we're all in the same place is that have I captured that correctly uh, yes broadly yes Excellent. okay thank you. Um, so the, uh, the the City Council and the County Council are developing drafts um, and uh, you know they will be they are I think they are uh, sharing their thinking with us um, and other plans have looked at communities and the, the economy. So obviously we have the combined authority uh, with their plan, which is, um, I think Anne Ainsworth has reminded us, was refreshed in March and I'm sure uh, is going to be refreshed again, particularly once we have that evidence base for new, um, uh, new, new, ways, of, new ways of working in, in particular um, and the impact on some of the combined authority schemes. Obviously, we work very closely with, uh, with the city uh, through our local plan, so it's going to be imperative that we are uh, in a, in aligned with them. And um, obviously, the county council has uh, changed, its, um, changed its leadership recently, and conversations go on, go on regularly between, between us. Um, so I think you know, this, is, this is very much a draft, and I think as soon as we've got feedback from this committee and we have made the amendments to this draft based on uh, the feedback we've got from scrutiny overview I think we probably need to uh, establish a meeting with colleagues at both the county council and at the city uh, whether that's at officer level to start with or whether it's at uh, member level I'm not quite sure at the moment I will ask for advice on that to make sure that this is all complement complementary um, you know, we're not trying to do different different things, but bearing in mind that you know South Cambridgeshire is rural, and therefore our challenges are different to the challenges of uh, of the city. But you know, there are all sorts of economies to uh, to be delivered by doing doing things together, both financially and as far as, far as human resources concerned. Um, and if Anne Mainsworth may come in, please, because of course she's been involved in all these. Uh, uh, the kind of weekly, if not daily, conversations with the, uh, the CCG, which has stimulated a lot of this. Uh, Lida, if you bear with us a moment, I, I think her boss actually wants to come in. So I'm going to invite Liz Watts to address the meeting. Well, well, not to take any of the glory from Anne, because she's done the lion's share, in fact, all of the work on this plan. But I think since I currently chair the um, Cambridge and Peterborough Public Service Board, which is the board made up of all of the chief executives from across the system in Cambridge and Peterborough, um, it's probably I can probably give some reflections on the partnership working stuff. So obviously it's much easier. Anything that's kind of within our control is much easier to deliver. And there are some parts of the plan that we can crack on with um, and deliver without needing to refer to other partners. Um, but I think what we have learned from COVID is, uh, well, we'll start, we spent a lot more time together uh, because we, you know, at the beginning we were meeting every single day, we now meet twice a week. 
Um, and I think we've all realised that there are opportunities, as Anne has already mentioned and the leader has mentioned, where we could do better for our residents by, by working more closely together. So that's our ambition and we will be um, sort of working sort of really uh, hard on that in the coming months. I, I think it's fair to say that this stuff is not easy. Um, so it's hard enough changing things within an organisation. Changing things across organisations and multiple organisations is really challenging. But uh, I think the good thing is that everybody has recognised from COVID that the, the prize is worth it, that uh, we need to work differently and work um, more closely with partners and probably compromise more, give up some of the things that um, mean that we can move things along with partners um, at, at uh, where we might have wanted to do something one way, but we realise that in order to work across um, the system, we might need to do it slightly differently. And I think we you know, need to have some really honest conversations with partners, both at officer and member level, um, in order to make that stuff work. So, you know, this isn't an easy um, goal or project, uh, but I think we all recognise that the prize is worth it and certainly something that's very much on, on our radar. Thank you Thank very you, much, Chair. Liz. Alan, did you wish to say anything at this point? Um, I'll, I'll just add something, Chair, if that's OK. Please. Thank you. Um, just to say as well, I, I've actually got them in front of me. So Huntingdonshire, uh, their report on recovery, um, which was a report for scrutiny that went earlier this month. And also from the City Council, their outline recovery plan went to their scrutiny earlier this month as well. Um, that actually went to their strategy and resources scrutiny. So um, when I was talking earlier about the, the timeline of the partnerships, um, we're trying to move those forward essentially uh, together as closely as possible. Um, and the other thing at the moment, as you can imagine, all the plans are focused on things like uh, the economy and communities and vulnerable people. When it gets down to the detail of it, it will look slightly different, as you can imagine, because the acute need in different areas uh, obviously would, would be slightly different. And I think that's where those conversations are going to come in. You know, are there uh, particular actions, maybe just a small number, that initially we might focus on together because we feel we can have a greater impact by doing that? Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Anna Blackman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and I will be brief because I'm mindful we've been talking about this for quite a long time. That'll be a first. <laughs> no, no, don't be mean. <laughs> I'm often succinct. So what I wanted to say is that looking at page 19, I'm particularly pleased that this council is concentrating uh, on young people who've been particularly affected by the impacts of multiple lockdowns, their education and their mental health. And in particular, I note uh, the report says we'll particularly focus on those who are children who are looked after and children leaving care. Now, you will appreciate that I am the chairman of the county corporate parenting uh, subcommittee uh, whose responsibility children in care are particularly. So I'm delighted that the district council wants to work with the county council to support the children in our care. And I'm very happy to link up if that is of any help uh, but in particular, um, you refer on page 24 to linking our services together um, and improving data sharing, um, supporting initial investment in uh, domestic abuse training, and we're very mindful uh, that that has been a particular concern during the pandemic, and we had some excellent training on that uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm also keen that we're looking at this opportunity to expand the Wild Minds project, which has been so helpful and I believe is being held at Norton Country Park initially, but may expand from there, I suspect. But also this working with the County Council to create a locally tailored package of support for young people, um, those who are particularly vulnerable before the pandemic and who've been hit particularly badly by it. So I'm very happy that this council is and is engaging in this cross-county working because I think this is so important. It's happened through gold command with flooding and it's happened through the pandemic. And I think it's um, the way ahead because I think we'll, um, we're, our aims are going to be similar and um, I'm delighted to help in whatever way I can with that. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Leader. And so thank you to uh, Councillor Bratton. I welcome your very succinct uh, com comments there. Um, so it was a particular wish of Cabinet that this, um, this strategy had a focus on young people. 
because I, you know, I know lots of lots of older people have have died as a result of COVID, but the people whose lives are going to be impacted for decades are the young people. We can't just assume that because you know fewer of them have died, that actually you know they're not they're not victims of this as much as anybody else is. So you know these are these are young people whose education has been disrupted, whose job prospects may never be as good as they they were whose mental health, uh, we know, has taken a hideous bashing and there's been very alarming increase in referrals into uh, the Children's Mental Health Service and a uh, big increase in eating disorders. You know, it's, this has been really, really bad for young people and it will continue if we do not act fast with our partners to be really bad for young people. And, you know, it is incumbent on all of us to prioritize the young so that they can put this behind them and get on get on with their lives as they would have done, you know, had this awful thing not, not happened. Um, so again, you've highlighted, you know, the hideous uh, increase in domestic violence. And it was one of the very, very first meetings I went to this, this, the vulnerability of people living in abusive uh, relationships was highlighted all, you know, at the absolute outset. So we knew this was going to happen uh, and things were, were put in place. We knew that children in homes you know, where the level of care wasn't as good as one would hope, who weren't getting regularly fed, you know, if they weren't in school, actually the risks were greater. You know, they, they weren't getting their school meals. They weren't being looked at, looked at by teachers on a daily basis. And very, very concerningly, very early on, the number of referrals of children into the social care system dropped dramatically. And that's because they weren't coming into contact with those responsible adults who were on the lookout for the signs of abuse or mistreatment or neg neglect. So that, you know, those... You know, we are we are only now, I think, really uh, coming to terms with that, and uh, the numbers are, are going up again. So it's absolutely imperative that we do everything we possibly can to uh, save save the future of our young people. And I think, you know, most of us uh, in this meeting are parents of young people of various ages, and so you know, this this matters matters desperately to us. So I thank Councillor Bradman for uh, the offer of her support in this partnership working. And, um, you know, we will, yeah, it, it is a priority for me personally, and I imagine for, for all of you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Graham Kerr. Thanks very much, Chairman. I'll try and be brief as well. Um, so I, I'd echo a lot of what has already been said, really. I think um, the... Um, leader and the chief executive um, talked about this being you know not an easy report to to write and then sort of deliver and I agree with that and I think the reason for that is because it covers so many different areas across the council from housing and planning and green issues and loneliness and you know so on and so on and and then made more difficult by having to you know work you know, across councils and with other organisations. So I understand that that, that is um, difficult. Um, I, I also agree with um, Councillor um, Chung Johnson that, you know, it's very important that this report has clout and part of giving it clout, I think, is making sure that, you know, we hone down those action points and people have a clear... Um, sort of strategy and policy that they can apply in their local communities um, so they can find, you know, that those policies sort of deliverable on, on the ground. That's not a criticism, that's just, you know, how I'm reading the, the sort of document. I suppose my, my own thing uh, reading this document, and uh, the, the leader did refer to this already about how the council is working with the NHS and uh, health providers, all I'd add to that is that, um, you know, it's very important that also that is done on a local level. So GP services, district nurses, local charities that provide mental health um, uh, support, uh, patient participation groups, all of those things I think could feature more in the action plan than, than they do 
uh, currently, but obviously it's the first sort of draft of that. But I think, you know, one of the, the most important things that sort of really um, engage people to start um, participating in their community was seeing some of the sickest and most vulnerable people, you know, um, going without, you know, prescriptions or struggling to, to access services and, and wanting to help out in that way. So linking up those local services, I think, is in, important and, and how that is done within this report needs to, you know, be, be clear to give it clout. Uh, thanks, thank you, thank you Councillor Cote. So your, your comments are really, really helpful, actually, um, particularly as you come from a, from a, a health service background. Uh, thank you for acknowledging that this isn't easy. You know, it's not easy because actually COVID has affected every single aspect of our lives. You know, so it's not like we're dealing with a flood, which generally speaking, you know, it has you know, a, a limited impact. This has affected every single place in our communities, every, just about every business, every, every person, every, every organization. So that's why it's really, it's really not easy. And I thank you for, for acknowledging that. Um, you're quite right that we need to hone down the actions. Um, and I'm very pleased that you said you want to see evidence that, of, of which actions can actually be applied at a local level into um, deliverables on the ground. So thank, thank you for that. And we will take that away and we will endeavour to, uh, you know, probably with some more, some more consultation, uh, endeavour to get sort of greater clarity on that. But if there's anything specific you want to feed back to um, us now or outside of this meeting about what you think some of those deliverables could be, what really matters, particularly to your own community, then that would be really helpful. And on, you know, working locally with the health service, I think that's one of the hard hardest nuts to crack it's been really tough so you know my own gp's practice has taken a lot of criticism you know i know it has been really tough my sister works in a gp's surgery not in south cambridgeshire you know she has been made ill by the fact that the phone rings non-stop from eight o'clock in the morning and people are stressed and they're angry and at times they're at times they're abusive and, you know, it really takes its toll on the people who are, uh, you know, answering the phones, never mind the, you know, the medics who are dealing with the stuff behind. So, you know, it's been very, very hard on our primary, primary health care. Um, people have been frustrated because they haven't really understood what's going on and people feel unsettled because they don't think they've got the same sort of access to primary health care that they had before. And we've seen, you know, we've seen some emerging tragedies with people not accessing uh, health care when they should have done. So, you know, rises in, um, in cancers that not being treated early enough and heart attacks and strokes not being treated hard enough. Now, I think the health service has done a formidable job in addressing these problems as soon as it became apparent that there was a problem there. But I completely agree with you. We need, as the local authority, to you know, investigate ways in which we can be working better in partnership with primary health care within our, within our villages, as well as with you know, the, the higher level, level providers. You know, we, need to be, we need our doctors and our district nurses and our midwives to be talking with us. Uh, and again, any suggestions you have of how we can achieve that will be much appreciated. Um, does Anne Ainsworth want to add anything to that? Because I'm sure this is uh, high on her list of priorities, if, if not Anne, uh, Liz's as well. No, I, think, um, I think I see shaking heads at this time, but we can always come back to that later. Councillor Sally Ann Hart. Thank you, Chair, and I will definitely be brief. <laughs> um, I just note that uh, this is described as a developing draft and, and just say thank you for it because I think had we not seen this today, we may well have been sitting here wondering where, where is South Cambridge District Council's um, draft uh, reset and recovery plan. So thank you for that. Um, at the risk of, of looking foolish, and I'd like to thank Councillor Fane for helping me. Um, I now know that on page 26, LERS is Local Economy Recovery Strategy. Um, I quite like playing abbreviation bingo. I'm still stuck on MTFP, 
um, which is on the same page, page 26, and just on page 23, GBA. So I'm just wondering if, if in, in future drafts, some of those abbreviations can be, can be spelled out. Thank you. Uh, yes, I do remember when I was a fairly new councillor, I felt, you know, I, I, there would be death by acronym. And um, actually, um, Ian Senior is a, is a stickler, you, you know, for making sure that uh, acronyms are spelt, spelt out. So GVA, gross value added, and uh, the medium term financial plan. But uh, thank you for reminding us the need to explain the acronyms. I think that's a very useful reminder. Thank you very much indeed. Martin, if you want to come back, but you must be brief, please. Yeah, it's, just brief. it's really just to highlight something which I think we need to keep in, in life because it, it may develop, it may not. Uh, I'm thinking about university students who have been living an extremely different life the last few years. My, my two children are both now finishing their second year at university, of which three quarters has been at, uh, at, at distance without other contact. So university students have lost one of the big elements of university life, which is all the social life that comes back to other events that take place, because that is really difficult to do at a distance. You don't make the contact, you don't meet people in lectures. Now, the question is now whether, because people are talking about doing much more of future teaching online and at distance. If we're going to be doing much more distance learning, that's going to be a big effect on students and their life. And we need to think carefully about whether we need to replace that at home. So even though we don't have a university here, we, all have, we do have a high proportion of families which have given, given a, a university. It may be something we need to think about. Um, how do we replace these other aspects of student life which they will be missing if they're doing everything online? That's just a thought. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Judith Little. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you also for this draft coming early. We discussed this and we wanted to see it as an early draft so everyone could put so much in, input into it. One thing that I really thought about whilst I've been listening to what everyone's been saying, and I don't know if the leader agrees with me, is that mental health seems to be the connecting factor between all these threads. And could that be used as a kind of um, a theme to tie all of this together? as the main focus for how we kind of um, sharpen this into more of a decided plan. Leader. So that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought. So, I'm gonna, so I don't think I can make an on the hoof um, comment on that. I think it's something, I, you know, we need to take, take away and look at. And I think I need to read the document again with that, in the, with that in the back of my mind about whether that's, that's the common thread. I mean, my thought was that kind of resilience, future resilience was, was the, the was kind of golden thread. But of course, mental health is, is part of that as well. So that's, if we may take that away and think about that. Um, but I mean, if what you're saying, Councillor Rifford, is, is that, you know, mental health needs to feature, you know, is it needs to be a high, you know, a, a high priority here, and it needs to feature more widely. Then again, we can consider that as that as well. Thank you, the chair. I wasn't really expecting you to say yes or no on the hoof. Um, it just had occurred to me, probably more so well over the past hour, whilst people were commenting, and it might be a sort of strong way of um, making things work. And across the partnerships and across, um, you know, different organisations. Thank you, Judith. Um, I think if I could try and summarise just some of the points that have been made, um, I think this has been an excellent discussion, and I hope members that it will trigger other thoughts in your minds, which I hope you will feed back to Anne Ainsworth at a, at a later point. Um, it is important that we try and capture um, all your thoughts. And I think, for me, perhaps one of the key objectives is to identify the uh, short-term gains that we can get uh, and separate them from the long-term ones. Amongst our partners, there are organisations that carry and hold a huge amount of data. And uh, I'm thinking, for my own part, 
the combined authority business support group has a lot of information on businesses and um, individual uh, job losses. So there must be an awful lot of data that we could gain from partners which would perhaps help to fulfil uh, Peter's objective of having uh, identified measure, measurement points so that we can quantify things. For me, one of the key, one of the key areas is that we retain the fabulous income and outstanding support that we have from our volunteers. Um, I can tell you that in Hardwick, we're doing a couple of things in the next few weeks. Uh, I spoke to the vicar many months ago and asked that we should have a service of thanksgiving for all the volunteers that have helped. Um, I'm, we still haven't been able to do it. Uh, I had hoped that we'd have done it months ago, but of course we couldn't. Uh, and I'm not sure in any event that our little church in Hardwick is big enough to bring everyone together. But one way or another, we will do it. And we're also having a village party uh, in September when all the village will come together and we'll give everyone the thanks that we can. And I'm sure uh, that's something that other parishes might want to consider. I think the recreation and culture as cultural aspects are key and linking whatever we do with a text to the action plan and our local plan would be very, very helpful. There are so many issues here. Um, please do um, take time when you go home to put those emails together, put all those thoughts together, uh, and let's uh, give this as much help and support as we can. Okay. Um, Leader, you wish to come back? Uh, so, so thank, thank you very much indeed, Chair, for your very helpful comments. Um, I would like to thank all the members of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee for their consider, you know, the considerable attention they've given to this, uh, this piece of work and uh, just to say how valuable all their, their input has been. Um, but I would just like also to thank Anne Ainsworth, who has worked incredibly hard on this uh, at a time when there are many, many demands on her time. And I, I suspect uh, she hasn't been having very many hours of sleep. So, you know, she's, she's had to do quite a major rewrite at the behest of Cabinet in a very short period of time for this to come to you. So my considerable thanks to her and to all the colleagues who have supported her. Thank you, Leader. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, that takes us on to item seven on the agenda, which is the street trading controls adoption of schedule four the Local Government Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1982 and designation of consent streets as set out on pages 27 to 32 of your pack. And here to present it is Councillor Brian Milnes. Brian, welcome. Hello, uh, Councillor Chamberlain, how are you? Um, well, at the moment, I'm keeping dry despite the weather outside where it is absolutely pouring down with rain. <laughs> I, drove, I drove through about uh, three or four inches on the A11 505 junction very carefully earlier on my way home. So take care out there. Um, so I'd like to uh, introduce this, um, uh, this policy to uh, the uh, uh, committee. And uh, it's a confluence of two different things, uh, which are uh, the movement uh, of the district from some 106 parishes, I think, maybe a few, a couple more, um, to one that includes um, a substantial population of new towns and settlements such as Camborne and Northstow, and later Water Beach and, uh, and Bourne. And the second thing is the rise of uh, the food truck phenomenon, uh, which we've seen during the pandemic when the uh, restaurants and uh, uh, pubs with food uh, were forced to uh, stop uh, their in-house trade um, and in fact in a, uh, I should also introduce a, a third different component uh, coming to this which is our appointment of Rachel Jackson who's with us uh, this evening as principal licensing officer who is bringing a vast amount of experience in this to um, the council and who has already been working on not only this uh, uh, policy revision, but also uh, gambling uh, and taxi 
uh, licensing as well. So um, in keeping and uh, in, in very familiar ways with the earlier item that you've just been discussing, uh, we're bringing this as an early stage to you, which was the, is the first part of uh, changing the way that we structure the um, street licensing policy. Um, currently, it, it's not equitable. Uh, you can get a bizarre situation when, uh, uh, if a, a boundary between two parishes um, crossed a, a lay-by, you could uh, legally park in one half of it with no fee. On the other half, you'd be um, obliged to pay an £800 fee to park there and work that patch or pitch. And uh, clearly, that's uh, that's not equitable. It's 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 unreasonable. Uh, we've also got uh, anomalous uh, situations, for example, where if a, a food truck truck wanted to uh, work uh, different patches or pitches uh, every evening of the week, then he'd be uh, or they they would be obliged to pay a separate fee for each pitch that they uh, had permission for. And currently, this means there's a whole mishmash of different or no licensing um, uh, conditions taking place across the district, and that clearly is not right. So this um, uh, document before you tonight uh, sets out um, the process by which we want to change this, and it introduces the process of uh, consultation uh, coming after this uh, agreement in principle uh, which we're looking for to adopt uh, this act across the whole of the district uh, consistently irrespective of the parish, which is the way it was working before. So there were a limited number of uh, street consents, uh, which you've got a list of in the appendix of the document. So unless uh, Rachel wants to add anything to uh, my summary there, uh, in case I've missed anything, um, over to you for a discussion, I think. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Rachel, did you wish to add anything to Brian's comments? No, thank you, Chairman. I think Councillor Mills has uh, covered it very, very well. I don't know if there's any kind of information. Obviously, members will ask any questions they wish. I'm sure between myself and Councillor Mills, who will be able to answer them this evening for you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank I'll you. now open it to uh, discussion with Councillors, and Councillor Anna Bradman will kick us off. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Milnes, for presenting the report. And thank you to Rachel Jackson for producing the report. And um, I should perhaps, I don't know, declare an interest because I'm chair of the licensing committee. Uh, so this is something that we've um, long wanted to come forward. So I'm very pleased that Rachel has uh, grappled with this problem because it, we've known for some time um, I've been chair of the licensing committee for the previous four years, and we've known that there is this anomalous situation that arises. Um, and perhaps um, for those who are less familiar with it, the situation is, as Councillor Milnes has explained, that in some villages um, there are no controls. People can um, set up where they wish. And in others, as per the list in Appendix A on page 31, um, those street traders can must seek the permission of both this council and the parish council. And that means that they come under the, um, our ability to control both, and indeed the parish council's ability to control, for example, things like the location of the pitch, um, the hours and the terms, and also, of course, all sorts of peripheral things, uh, like that they must install a litter bin and they must make provisions to tidy up after them, and also, from the council's point of view, that these people are licensed and are controlled in terms of their um, sa our safeguarding concerns for what might also be going on uh, as, a, as a side issues to the trading that they're legitimately doing. So it's, I'm really glad that we're going to try and bring this under the, um, uh, we, we would like to bring it under the control of the council because it gives us an opportunity to exert a degree of control and management over the street traders. That's not to say I'm not happy with the, the street traders who have set up during the pandemic, and I know in many villages, uh, North Stowe, and indeed in my own um, 
ward of Lime Beach. I know that the villagers have been delighted to have a food van, different food vans coming there different nights of the week, um, which has given them an enormous source of um, release and pleasure from having to cook their own supper. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, I would like to have some brief explanation. Um, what I mean is, in the report that comes eventually to council or indeed to cabinet, it would be useful if we could have some brief explanation of the scope of the, of the current situation in not using my words, but in a description as given by Councillor Milnes and of, of how, the, how it works now. But I'd also like to have um, some information about uh, what the cost would be and what the impact will be on those um, traders who are currently unlicensed or perhaps working without this control. So I think it, it would be very useful to have that as an introduction to the report. Um, and I'm, I'm just very glad that we're taking this, un, we're hoping to take this under our wing. And I'm also very glad that there will be a consultation with the police, Cambridgeshire County Council Highways, uh, because of course this um, relates to our A roads as well and the lay, lay bys on the A roads. Uh, but we're also going to be conducting a consultation with the parish councils, and I think that's absolutely right and appropriate so parish councils have an opportunity to have their say. So thank you very much for bringing this report forward, and I look forward to its working its way through those consultation processes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Bradman. Councillor Milnes, would you like to come back? On Just the very briefly, I think um, um, Councillor Bradman's... Um, questions and, and comments are more, more, more than welcome and that's what we're hoping to see because we've got such a now a variety of circumstances throughout the uh, district as I um, said in my introduction um, we've got very different circumstances from a very small um, village uh, uh, with its own parish whose uh, parish councils may not for example meet uh, every month because they're relatively small and we've got to come up with a policy that accommodates that. And then one of the, our large new towns, for example, or our larger villages, where there are plenty of opportunities for people to park up and um, uh, serve food in this way. At the moment, it's, it's slightly complicated. We offered, for example, a, a, a six months fee amnesty. Uh, I'm afraid Rachel has inherited some, something of a mishmash of uh, circumstances to try and resolve. So uh, it's going to take some, some work. And I think that cooperation with local members is going to be absolutely critical, as is the consultation, uh, particularly with the parish and town councils, uh, some of whom, uh, for example, in North Stone, the volunteer uh, group has uh, uh, arisen to manage this. Uh, so they, uh, the, they manage the pictures, they uh, take a fee that they give to uh, anything remaining, uh, any, any, any profit, notional profit goes to charity there. Um, but we are not included. Um, and uh, that's uh, not the intention of the Act uh, to control this, because what we want to do is make sure that all the, the operators are working, for example, you know, to a healthy uh, re regime, uh, with the food hygiene standards that they need to do to serve, serve food and th thereby not put our uh, residents at risk. Uh, and at the moment, that isn't being done consistently. In some places, there is no licensing, there's no record of who is uh, trading where, uh, and, and that needs addressing. Uh, in terms of fees, again, we're, we're uh, going through this uh, changing circumstances. It may... Uh, the, the demand for food trucks, now that we've got um, less restrictions uh, in our, uh, particularly in our pubs, um, it, it may mean that the uh, demand for food truck uh, uh, dis business is, um, is going to fail. Uh, but we need something that can cope with that. In t and for example, in terms of charge per site, charging £800 per site per day is very expensive if you want to run that five or seven days a week. Uh, so that has to be uh, taken into account as well. Um, and we would like to be able to obviously cover our costs here, uh, and that's part of
part of the uh, equation that we'll have to uh, put together. Sorry, that was slightly longer than I anticipated. Thank you, know. Councillor Milne. I'm, I'm glad you recognise that. <laughs> Could I call upon Councillor Claire Daunton, please? <laughs> Not sure I can follow that one. <laughs> Mine was just a very simple point, actually, <laughs> and that was to say that I welcome this, and, and I, I think really it's rather repeating what Councillor Braddon says in terms of the um, getting a handle really on, on safety and security across the district, safeguarding security, food safety, food security, um, and really general well-being, um, both for the street traders and for our communities, and I think this is an important step in doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did you wish to come back briefly on that, Councillor Milne? <laughs> Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll mention one thing while I, 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 uh, we're, we're talking about this, because there is a further complication, uh, for example, that's introduced by the Act, which talks about public access. Uh, so we've had several cases uh, in, in the last year and, and, and more uh, where people have said, but I've got the owner's uh, permission uh, to operate on his land, and therefore I don't need it from you as well. But that's actually not true. If there is public access, and if you're serving food from two trucks, you obviously have to have public access, by definition, uh, then the Act applies. And, and this itself is a contentious issue that we'll have to deal with with this policy as we go forward. That's an interesting point, because I have to say I have quite not understood that. But thank you for that. I'm going to go online uh, to remotely now to Councillor Steve Hunt. Please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering whether we have any uh, estimates for how many food trucks or other outlets will be affected by this. It just seemed to me that it would be a nice thing to have, even if it's, um, you know, the best estimates we have. Uh, do you have any information like that? And, and is there any possibility that... Um, I've no idea what the charges and costs of, of this are and, and, and also the inventory of uh, challenges that it might make for some very small businesses. Is there a risk that we're going to put some thriving business, some, some new business that's come about as a result of the pandemic out of business because of this, either because of the costs or because they don't have the skills to apply for, for, for hygiene standards or because the local parish council might not want them? What's, what, what's, where do we stand with that? Thank you. So there is a bit of a burden in terms of application, although that's not the, the worst aspect. I think there's, from from memory, I think it, uh, you'd need sort of 10 pages of forms and uh, photographs of uh, uh, various other sort of documentation certification uh, from uh, food hygiene, uh, I think is one of one of them. Uh, and indeed, um, you know, another potential contentious issue, you have to provide a photo of your, um, uh, your dispensing vehicle. Um, or, or truck or trailer. Um, and there is a question, for example, over whether there should be any sanction available uh, that says it doesn't look right or it's not appropriate for this area, which is part of the reason we need to uh, have a consultation with uh, uh, town and parish councils about their input to this. How much control or influence do they want over, over this pro uh, process? I don't think uh, Rachel can confirm this. I don't think we've ever done any audits of how many current uh, uh, operators there are. We obviously know how many we have, we've licensed, but there are su substantial numbers. So actually going back to the parishes and towns uh, would be a really useful um, um, uh, way of getting information, more information about how many of those uh, operators are doing so at the moment. Rachel, did you wish to come in on that? Thank you very much, Chair. I was just going to say, just to give you a bit of perspective there, I think it's a very valid question. We have got 31 issued consents currently, and we have the um, food park, which represents a kind of a consortium of food trucks in the district and actually county-wide. So we actually have 11 operators that were very keen to come on board with the licensing scheme, and they currently operate within our district. On top of that, we have another 11 operators who are currently working across Cambridgeshire who may well come on board in due course, subject to how effective the policy is. But I think I just want to mention, if I may, just one very brief comment. 
we're absolutely right to look at making sure it's regulated and safe with regard to food. I think another the key critical point here as well is making sure the vendor is actually fit and proper, I use the old taxi terminology there, to be a trader. We want to ensure that we are providing a safer environment for people in our community to actually go to a trader who has been vetted as well. They have to do a statutory declaration. Whereas the other schemes we have currently, obviously the, there's no requirement, and I'm not sure what local schemes that we have. But I say, we, to give an idea of figures, we've got, say, 11 certain, shall we say, as good as certain as we can be, 11 possible. Then we have about, between three and five, I'd say, uh, traders that have been currently licensed, perhaps incorrectly, by the authority, or we know they are just on the boundary of where they should be licensed. So we've identified a couple of those traders. On top of that, as part of my initial kind of consultation or discussions with the parishes, we know there are apparently maybe a small handful of operators who are currently operating under their local scheme, should we say. So we're probably looking about an additional 15 to 25. But as I as, as Councillor Mills has mentioned, depends on appetite, and intended perhaps, uh, what appetite there is actually for you know, the food registration, the food registrations, and of course, street trading when the time comes. Thank you very much. Councillor you, Jeff Harvey. Are you with us, Jeff? Yes, I'm good, yeah. No, I just, um, if I may, I wondered, um, is there sort of consistency and a coherence, if you like, um, especially for uh, locations which border the city? Um, and do they have similar sort of regulations? And, you know, to avoid sort of some of the anomalous situations that occurred with, with, with parking uh, in those areas. Um, and also I wondered um, whether this is sort of net revenue generate, generator for um, our council. And, and if so, does this, is this kind of neutral in terms of what you might view as a sort of tax on uh, street traders? So I'm going to make, make a couple of brief points, but then uh, pass to Rachel, um, because I haven't got any information directly about the way that Cambridge City operates, for example, but I have spoken to people who work across the border, um, and um, they are uh, really worried. And it's not just the city, it's el elsewhere on the, on the fringes of, of the district, where they might want to operate elsewhere at the same time, and therefore... Uh, if they were doing it uh, legitimately, might have to pay several, um, in the worst case, several license fees uh, for, for the same operation. However, there's, there's also the other aspect of uh, competition. So, uh, for example, let's imagine that there was a, a pizza um, trailer turning, turning up uh, and parked itself in your uh, high street uh, opposite the local pizza shop or even Domino's. Uh, and started trading. Now, those businesses that are, are paying business rates may not be very happy uh, with um, a uh, food truck that's paying relatively little uh, to turn up and trade uh, compared to what they're, they're paying. So there's, there's a, a further question of equitability between uh, schemes of, of being able to trade that we'll have to take into consideration. Rachel? Thank you, Councillor. Yes, a couple of points there just to follow on from that. Uh, City actually have a different scheme uh, with regard to identifying pitches. I don't want to confuse the matter too much, but we have something called a street trading consent, which is where we're looking at a flexible approach. Street trading licenses, which are licensed streets. So City, in the main, focus on a couple of key points within the City where street trading is allowed, and I think maybe it's a seasonal pitch, etc. So ours would be slightly different, but obviously, as we have any kind of policy, we always consult with our neighbours as well. Um, and the other part was... Are we looking at being restrictive as an income generator? Short answer that, unfortunately. I know Liz is our boss is here, and obviously we've got the leader of the council. They'd like me to say, yes, we're going to be making lots of money here with the street trading regime, but unfortunately we cannot. Licensing does not permit us to make a profit, so it's got to be seen to recover the cost. And it's very much, as I say, what we are looking at is, is supporting the business. Obviously, the last 18 months, I know obviously the council has been extremely good at supporting local businesses, um, and to say what we wouldn't want to have is a commodity clash, shall we say. So it's quite right, as Councillor Nons has said, we've got great flexibility we can put into the policy. That would say we have got Pizza Express outside, and then we don't really want a pizza truck two metres away from it trading at exactly the same time. So it's just 
And obviously, the, our residents probably don't want that either. The whole thing is about diversity, different range of food stuffs, and different opportunities available. So we have got a number of options available to us within the policy because we're looking at a consent. Um, but I think what I'm also looking for is a lot more guidance as well. So what, obviously, an applicant can expect when he or she submits an application, and also what we're expecting of our parish councillors, because uh, so far, they've, I know they've done a great job, but they're kind of clutching us towards saying, we don't want this. And the policy at the minute says, we can't, you know, we have to have, make sure it's in this category, I, it's, a, it's a safe space to be, of course, on a lay-by, or example, in a, in a cut-through, in, in a pub car park, where it is safe to trade. We don't want people... Goodness, you know, goodness knows, you know, going on to the, the highways, we've had some very random applications. I've only been here just over the four months, but people actually coming in, a very single lane through for, through flow of traffic, people expecting to pitch his burger van there. And you're just thinking, no, we've got to have the sensible approach. But I think by tailoring our brand new policy, which will be a lot more flexible, it will give a lot more opportunities because the, the approach will be it's blanket wide. So in other words, anything is possible. However, make sure you're maintaining the kind of control, support, the investment. Of our, I would say our main stakeholder, in fairness, which is the parish councils here, because they obviously are obviously the most impacted. Um, and of course, everything else, we, we can consult with the highways, because obviously we're affecting them, but we don't need to consult with them, interestingly, to designate consent streets. But best practice, I would obviously be seeking their, their view, although there's no actual requirement in law for us to notify them, but I think best practice just talking previously, the previous agenda item about how good our partnership working is, and I would hate to um, sever any ties or any opportunities there. So it would be very much making sure our neighbouring authorities are involved, and of course the highways and police, etc. as Councillor Mills has already mentioned. So lots of stakeholders involved, but it's very much maintaining the protection, should we say, that um, our local parishes have had, and obviously also protecting where they have the rights to say, for example, what I have found is a couple of areas have their own bylaws, local bylaws. So the village of Green, for example, is protected by a historic bylaw. Our policy won't override that. If it says no street trading permitted, then absolutely fine. That, that's how it will remain. So it's making sure we preserve the, you know, the, the local provision, but obviously enhancing and supporting the, our local businesses as well and encouraging new business. Thank you, Rachel, for that very enthusiastic reply. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Councillor Sarah Chung Johnson, Sarah. Hi, I'd like to echo uh, what uh, Anna and Kev already raised that this um, uh, policy is, is uh, really welcome. And thank you very much for responding to the feedback that I know that we've given as a community here in North Stowe, which really welcome and benefit from these food shops because we, we don't have any other shops or restaurants. So this is kind of um, one way our community can feel like they're getting some kind of uh, retail experience, so to speak. So I just wanted to highlight, obviously, that, um, you know, admin is, is a big deal for these food trucks. Uh, they don't want them spending their business time um, uh, going through so many different applications. So it's really great to see that it could be combined. Um, but obviously, also, just while we run through this policy to ensure that the costs for them as well um, are uh, easily managed. Um, and also for a lot of the traders that they're working on, as you say, across the county, so across district boundaries. So if there are opportunities to work with our partner councils to ensure that our policies align with theirs and to make everything a lot more simple for businesses, that would be really great. And I think it's also a great opportunity. I think the North Stowe food trucks um, and those within food park are really great examples of using sustainable plastic free policies which, um, again, we could perhaps look at being able to apply to more traditional, say, for example, uh, static burger van uh, kind of businesses that we could kind of try to influence uh, some of our um, uh, businesses to, to, to be more sustainable and green. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Councillor Mills, wish to add? Yes, um, I, I, I don't think I mentioned uh, particularly, but I've, I've, I've had some discussions uh, already with um, Bruce Thompson uh, in North Stone, who is the volunteer organiser of their food track, uh, trucks, as uh, Sarah Chung Johnson um, just mentioned. Um, this has been a very successful scheme, uh, and we would want, wherever we can, to make sure that what we introduce uh, can fit in with such a scheme. Um, and the, um, the other place that I've, I've just taken soundings from is Camborne. Uh, again, 
Uh, they've got a limited number of uh, uh, shops in their high, high street and uh, food outlets. And they similarly have uh, really welcomed the arrival of food tri trucks and have managed it quite well. Um, so I think um, the other um, brief thing about it, it may be interesting, and, and Rachel may uh, take a note of whether, whether it's possible to have a cross-boundary license. Uh, that perhaps so uh, if, if somebody was working in East Cams, for example, uh, but for part of the time, and maybe the predominant part of the time, but wanted to come into South Cams, whether we could do something with them and whether that uh, might work with Cambridge City as well. It sounds like it's a, a potential for horrendous bureaucracy. I wouldn't want to <laughs> add that to the equation if we could possibly avoid it. Thank you, Brian. Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I, from my understanding and from what the answer that was given and from my own research, Cambridge City doesn't actually have the system. Cambridge City doesn't have a blanket license control. Um, and I did check some of the other local authorities. Hunts doesn't have a blanket license control. North Hearts doesn't have a blanket license control. East Cams does. Um, so um, this is not something all the districts um, are doing. Um, and, and I, I must say I do have a number of concerns about this policy. Just because you can regulate something doesn't mean you should regulate something because regulation comes with costs. Now, all I've heard really and all I hear in this report is that the case for this is about uniformity. Um, and, you know, you might be on one half of a lay-by, might be in a, in a parish where you have to get a licence, another half um, doesn't. But, but are there any actual problems? I mean, are there any, is there any actual evidence of traders actually doing anything unsafe? Um, I mean, we don't even appear to know how many traders there are in the district, um, which is a little bit worrying that we're proposing to regulate. We don't even really know who we're regulating. So are there any actual, is there any actual evidence of any actual problems of, of unsafe um, practices? On that basis, um, has any consideration been given for proceeding down a different road whereby we don't take the power centrally and control as a district council why don't we write to individual parishes, as under the current approach, and ask individual parishes if they want this license extended to the parish? And presumably, if the parish had a problem, they will say, yes, we are not devolving power here. We are essentially taking a choice um, away from parish councils. So has any consideration been given to uh, proceeding in, in that direction? I would echo some of the comments that have been made by other councillors. Is this the time? We've just had a policy about helping local businesses. And now we have a policy where the councillor in charge has just told us there's going to be a 10-page form, a fee, and quite a bureaucratic process to get a trading licence. How does that fit with helping businesses recover from the pandemic? We're going to put a whole load of regulation and impose a whole load of cost uh, on businesses where they don't currently have that regulation um, and cost. So um, how does this fit with other um, aims? Um, and on that point about parishes I mean I think we talk as if and a lot of the talk has been somehow as if this licensing regime is going to increase provision of food vans or whatever and it, it, it's all going to be great I mean let me give you an example this coffee trader comes to my local church once a month it's been great really brought the community together people go there if he has to pay 240 pounds for a license um, for one trip a month I would very much doubt he'd come again because I can't imagine you make that much profit. Um, so, um, you know, we are going to take services away from local communities by doing this, and you might not fancy filling in a 10-page form either, um, and the extra bureaucracy um, that comes with it. Um, but two other questions, just to finish up. Uh, if we do adopt this, are we going to revise our current policy um, on street, street trading, or will we just apply the existing one that applies in some places blanket across the district. Um, and secondly, or, my, or rather my final point, I've got a specific question about charity events and how charity events will be treated. Now under the current policy, as I read it, charitable events are exempt from the requirement, or traders at charitable events are exempt from the requirement uh, to pay a fee, but still require a license. Now, they are charitable events in all of our parishes. There's one particularly in Triplo, um, in my ward, that after the weekend it hasn't been able to run for the last two years. And I do slightly worry 
um, how, if, whether we're going to endanger the prospects of that if we say that the traders who come to the daffodil weekend, many of whom are outside the district, don't normally trade here, but come specifically for that event, have to fill in a 10-page form and get a CRB check or whatever just to come um, once a year to South Cams. Many of them may not come. Um, so what would the rules be around charitable events like that? As I say, just paying the fee is not necessarily the problem. People may be put off by the bureaucracy. Um, so some clarification on that um, would be welcome. Thank you. Councillor Milne, to get your teeth into that lot. Thank you. Yeah, so our libertarian uh, tendency, <laughs> Councillor Williams wants to uh, deregulate, um, and I, I share some of those sentiments uh, with him too. Um, but um, I guess the critical issue in this regard is food safety and uh, the health and well-being of our residents. Um, and making sure that unsafe practices are not being enabled by the fact that we haven't got a licensing system um, that works and identifies where people are trading and under what circumstances. So there's an issue of equitability. Uh, as we've, we've mentioned, the, uh, the cross-border where on one side it would be perfectly legitimate trade without a license, um, irrespective of the food safety issue, and on the other side, where a fee would be liable. Um, I think the, um, the general answer to your question about whether we'll be taking existing policy and rolling it forward um, is everything about the policy will be reviewed in light of current circumstances. As I introduced this uh, item, I mentioned that there were two different things coming together. Um, and as our, the, the shape and form of our uh, district changes, then we've got to make adaptations uh, to our current circumstances. Um, I think, the, um, as I say, the, uh, the essence of this is unsafe practices uh, need to be regulated, unfortunately, um, because we, we, we need to protect, protect our residents. That's the underlying... Um, reason for looking at doing this across the district. So, um, and there are plenty of, uh, you, you wanted to uh, ask the question. Uh, I'm afraid I personally know of five or possibly six uh, examples of food trucks uh, operating without licenses um, and with no food hygiene accreditation. on a couple yes. of points too, if I can. Um, yeah. yeah, please, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that this isn't about the height. The food hygiene safety regime is actually a different food safety hygiene, is, is a different regime. And whilst it might yes. be part of the licensing process, actually food safety inspections is a different thing. This isn't really about food safety inspections um, per se. Um, so, so I think it would be um, in, important to, to clarify that. So the answer to, to that question, if I may to you, Chair, is uh, to say if we're not aware of, of um, uh, food providers um, being, um, if we're not aware of their operation, then how do we enforce uh, food hygiene? Uh, so you'll, you'll know that um, if you're on the high street, uh, you uh, are... Uh, open to be inspected uh, randomly at any time uh, or because there's been complaints. So, uh, you know, a frequent complaint is rats have been seen in the vicinity of food premises. And so our uh, environmental health officers will uh, visit uh, and assess uh, their uh, compliance with hygiene reg regulations and cleanliness and so on. Um, so, so there is a, an, an inextricable link between the two, uh, two things. Uh, Rachel, I don't know whether you want to, I, I, if I've said anything that's technically wrong, please, please feel free to correct me. No, not at all, but if I may chair, just to answer a couple of points which hopefully um, may um, address some of Councillor Williams' concerns here. You asked a question, is there evidence? Thankfully, since I've been here, no there isn't, but obviously we're a regulatory authority. That's the job of licensing, to ensure we have safe, well-regulated businesses. It's a bit like saying there's been issues with taxi drivers. 
No, we don't. But if you look at, say, Rotherham, who didn't have stringent policies like ours, yes, you have significant uh, CSE and horrendous activity going on. So the, the, the idea of the policy is to create a fair and balanced approach to street trading district-wide, which ensures safe, and it's safe and well-regulated. Safe, say, look at food hygiene. Safe also meaning the individual is fit and proper to, say, trade in, a, a, in ice creams, have an ice cream run by a local primary school. This is what we are currently missing. I don't want to say alarm bells and raising alarm bells, but it's, it's to prevent bad things happening is to have a safe, regulated licensing regime. So I think the next question, I think one thing that hopefully will bring a smile to your face, Councillor, was about events. Say fairs, for example, in events such as a fair, so a charity event at a fair or a fun fair or a faith village fair, they are out of scope of the licensing in any case. So your events will not be negatively impacted by this policy. The policy itself is, and indeed the application form, because I'm all for brevity and making things as simple as possible. So the forms will be cut back as much as possible. But my key mission as well is to have a policy that is so succinct and it actually cuts back a lot of the bureaucracy in any case. A lot of the questions were asked beforehand. A lot of the confusion is caused by perhaps what's in our policy. So to make it clear, when you need a license, when you don't need a license, what can you expect to pay for a license, all of this, what happens, what's the process? All of those will be answered in this policy. So the policy we have at current will not be applying anymore. We'll have a fresh approach and a fresh policy. And I, I believe, Council, I think with all of Council Williams, I think... There was one other thing, Rachel, that I, I, I've just thought about, which, again, we've uh, got under uh, consideration, which was uh, DBS checking. Uh, because the, um, the situation at the moment is um, each licence has to be supported by its own DBS check. So um, I think we've actually, in practice, relaxed that uh, previously, and, and we would want a system where we could uh, rely on a single DBS uh, check per operator, per person. Okay. If I could, I'm, I'm really pressing my, my luck here, but can, can, I, can I just get clarification on that, 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 that last point about fears then? So would that mean that a, an event in a village whereby there are stalled trading on the village green um, for a weekend in festival wouldn't be in this, wouldn't be covered by this because the current policy suggests they would. It says charitable events don't pay the fee, but it says they would be subject to the licensing review. So if we could get that clarified, that'd be very helpful. It, I, I promise you, Councillor, sorry, uh, Councillor Mills and Chair, no, but can. it no. will certainly be covered and clarified within the policy exactly what is in scope of licensing on what is not. And, and I just have to remind you that it is it is not for a money-making incentive. This is to provide a self uh, well-regulated uh, street trading scheme across the district. Um, but I say the, the idea will certainly not be to uh, charities, which like many organizations have been so bad hit over the last 18 months, the last thing you want to do is hit them even further by bureaucracy and or fee payments unnecessarily. Thank you very much for that clarification. Councillor Anna Bradman, briefly, if you would, please. Thank you, Chairman, for letting me come back again. Um, Councillor Williams asked uh, for examples of where it's a problem. And, and actually, if we turn to pages 31, those two examples, All Roads in Waterbeach and C282, the Cambridge Road, Ely Road, and High Street, Milton, I can give you some examples. If we go to the C282, you'll appreciate this is a low classified class classification of road, and it winds through the village of Milton. Um, you can see this is a consent street, so in other words, consent was required through the parish council and the district council for trading on that street. In one of its bends, it goes past the front of a pub, and it was using their forecourt, one of the street trucks was using their forecourt for their vending exercise, which was extraordinarily dangerous because it was right on the junction of one, two, three, four, five different roads in, at different stages. And so people standing by the truck were at risk of being hit by cars from all sorts of different directions. So we thought, great, we've got our, con I, I checked it with the licensing authority and we were, don't worry, that's okay, high street, and this bend in the road 
is covered by your consent strip. So we exerted this authority on them and said, actually, no, we'd rather you didn't um, trade there. <laughs> and so they moved their operation, I would say, about 10 yards off the junction into Willow Crescent, which is not covered by this, and put their gas bottle right on the outside of their gas, of their food truck, which was extraordinarily dangerous as well. So in this case, we would have dearly liked it to be all streets in Milton. So we could have said, we don't want you to be trading here, but we would like you to trade here. And, and that would have given that, having that authority would have given the parish council much more power in that decision making. So that's one example. The second one is the fact that all roads in Water Beach are indeed covered as a consent street. And we had one trader using the forecourt of a cafe um, which was actually, um, the, the parish council didn't in principle object to them being there, but they were very concerned that actually, because actually the truck was right outside, it was parked in a very narrow side passageway for the cafe, and actually blocked the cafe's own fire escape for the flats which were over the top of the cafe. So here's, here are examples where having this authority gives us the power, in the, in the case of the Water Beach one, because it is all streets in Water Beach, we were able to say, no, please don't trade there, and we suggest you trade elsewhere. So this gives the parish and the district authority the ability to input to where we do or don't want trucks trading. So I hope, I hope that gives you an example of some useful um, so, so, powers that it gives us. Okay. Sorry, Jay. Yes. I'm going to call it a I, I mean, two points. One, it could work perfectly well in the current system. You could get it designated in Milton. And two, it, it's for the cabinet member to make these points, not for members to be telling me what the problems are. It's pretty shoddy. Uh, the gonna, if the cabinet member can't tell me what the problems are, there's going to be no work done on it. That's the point of a scrutiny committee. I'm going to draw this discussion to a close now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your uh, comments, members. Thanks to uh, Councillor Milnes and Rachel Johnson for your input. Um, this document goes to Cabinet on the 1st of September. I'm sure that both Rachel and Brian Milnes uh, would be happy to receive any comments that you wish to make outside the meeting. But I'm sure that you've also heard uh, the concerns that have been expressed here and you will give due consideration to those um, as this is a draft document before it gets to Cabinet on the 1st of September. So thank you both for your comments and thanks, members, for your input. And, and thank you, Chair. If I may, I'll just confirm that we're, I mean, the reason we're here is at your invitation for you to contribute uh, to that discussion. So that's been very useful this evening, I feel, including uh, Councillor Williams' question, you know, perfectly valid questions Absolutely. about the way it's uh, intended to work. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Uh, members, we now move to agenda item eight, which is the uh, work programme. And our next meeting will be held on the 14th of September. And you can see from the work programme that that will include the an update to the investment strategy and a further update to the medium-term financial strategy, not the MTMS presently listed. Um, and may I also remind members that uh, in September we will have two meetings, the first on the 14th of September, which will be that one, and secondly on the 21st of September, where we will consider the next stage in the preparation of the Greater Cambridge Joint Local Plan. That is likely to be, I suspect, a lengthy meeting. So you might wish to have your dinner before rather than afterwards, or perhaps we might arrange for a food vending van to come outside. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, my thanks to the leader, to Brian Mills, to Liz Watts, uh, to Anne Ainsworth for joining us for the first time, uh, to our colleagues from Democratic Services, uh, members who have joined us both here in the chamber and remotely, and any members of the public who have been watching this. And with that, 
I call this meeting to a close. Thank you for your attendance, and I genuinely mean it this time. Have a safe journey home.